Mayor, dear colleagues and participants following us online or here attending in person. And welcome to our session, Further and Faster, Local Climate Action and the Role of the Global Covenant of Mayors. My name is Giorgio Rambelli. I'm the Coordinator for Global Regional Coherence at the Secretariat of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. And it will be my great pleasure to be the moderator of your session today. So the session of today is organized by the Global Covenant of Mayors. And let's talk a little bit about the Global Covenant of Mayors. Totally more than 11,000 cities and local governments commitments and representing over 1 billion people, the Global Covenant of Mayors is the largest alliance of cities and local governments voluntarily committed to accelerate ambitious, measurable climate and energy initiatives to secure a low emission and climate resilient future. The unprecedented scale and scope of action needed to tackle the global climate challenges we are facing today and to deliver the necessary measure to decarbonize our society leave no question. We need all hands on deck now. Not only we need to raise ambition and commitment, but most of all, we must accelerate action across sectors, across level of government and across all parts of our society. The climate emergency that we are living and the green recovery that we so much need in order to build better, more resilient society following this pandemic represent not only a challenge, they also represent an opportunity to drive forward a transformation that will influence our societies like never before. And this is true from an environmental, a, so a social and also an economic point of view. So local governments have a key role to play in supporting and in, leave, in really leading also the delivery of this transformation and in meeting successfully the objectives of the Paris Agreement at the scale and at the, in the scale that is required. So they are not only administrators, but they can boost action through their political commitment. They can lead by example. They are not only service providers to the community they serve and represent, but also catalyzer for action and drivers of innovation and can deliver fit for purpose actions right on the ground, right where they are needed. So through commitment and leadership and by implementing day after day, restfully impactful climate action, in their communities, all our GCOM cities are, and local governments are walking the talk. They are achieving day by day the objectives of the Paris Agreement. So we more than three quarters of GCOM signatory setting more ambitious targets than their country's national determined contributions. More than half of these actions are also aiming to reduce this emission much faster, much quicker than their own member state and their own country. And they have a combined power of 110,000 climate action in the pipeline. And they are demonstrating that they are ready to really put forward action and implement. So today we want to discuss all of this. We want to take stock of the collective influence, but also of the leadership by GCOM signatories. We will hear some voices from the mayors in the GCOM community reinforcing the critical needs for climate action at all levels of government and across all sectors of society. We will hear a number of success stories highlighting how they are galvanizing force, their action are galvanizing force for local governments in building back better and in ushering in an equitable transition to a climate neutrality, but also a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also walk through a stock take of all the major impacts that the global covenant of major cities are making every day through the implementation of local action. And we will reflect upon challenges and enabling conditions that still needs to be strengthened in order to realize the full potential of climate action, such as, for example, a significant boost in urban climate finance. We will learn about the latest key outputs developed by the GCOM and its partners, and in particular around the collaboration that is needed to localize as much as possible the NDCs. We will also hear more about the newest GCOM country-tailored initiatives to support this process of multi-level action. And before we start the discussion, of course, with all of this as a background, I want to truly encourage our audience, both here on the, on the ground, but also online, to join our conversation, to post questions, to participate via using our slido.com application. You can scan the QR code over there. 
or you can just connect via the, your web browser and really participate into our conversations, share your thoughts, share your insight. We want to hear from you. Finally, I also want you to please know that at 11, we will observe a two minute silence to commemorate the armistice to end the fighting or the First World War as a prelude to peace negotiation. So with all of this, I'm delighted now to, to, to introduce to you my great lineup of speakers and panelists that will be joining me today in the conversation. We have with us uh, Mayor Eckhard Wurzner, is a GCOM board mayor and the mayor of Heidelberg, Germany. I'm also joined by Lord Mayor Anna Reynolds, also a GCOM board mayor and the mayor of Hobart in Australia. I'm also joined by Paula Kirk from Arup and Andy Deacon, the acting managing director of the GCOM secretariat, both joining me online, but also by Paolo Bertoldi from the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, also joining us online. We will also have the opportunity to have two more uh, climate leaders joining us today. And we will hear from Alejandra Boyos. She will be here with me. She's the director of the Sustainable Development Unit of the City of Merida in Mexico. And we will also have the pleasure to have with us Antoinette Anban. She's the head of city disaster and risks manager officer of the city of Baguio in the Philippines. And finally, we will hear closing remarks and inside thoughts by Gregor Robertson, the GCOM Global Ambassador. So, I think we are ready to start now and to really dig a little bit more into all of these different discussions that I was mentioning and in particular to highlight a little bit how cities are really moving further and moving faster with their own climate action and to start discussing decarbonization, climate neutrality, ambition, resilience and just transition and green recovery. It's my pleasure to give the floor first to Mayor Wurzner to tell us a little bit about the strategy that are implementing in Heidelberg. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, it's uh, wonderful to see you as friends from the GCOM uh, board and the GCOM network, because it's absolutely necessary that we're working closer together, that we tighten our uh, cooperation strengths and that we have the experience exchange, which we need. Um, also, as president of a wonderful network, which is called Energy Cities on the European level, I'm very proud to be in the board of the GCOM. I come to this a little bit later because we have to take into account that uh, beside our great engagement, we have to take into account that we have to go uh, to behave more like a political network and not just as an experience exchange and wonderful um, yeah, friendship uh, network with our own targets. As you have already heard from Georgia, in our wonderful introduction, uh, we all go uh, much uh, farther. We are not only believing that climate change is taking place, we take this into account already for years. For example, my wonderful city here in Germany, in Heidelberg, uh, the famous university town full of knowledge, we decided 12 years ago to build only zero emission buildings. 12 years ago. Since that time, we developed huge new developing zones in a 100% zero emission standard. All the buildings, not just one model building, all the buildings, schools, kindergartens, fire brigades, uh, uh, shopping uh, centers, whatever you want. And uh, till that time, we noticed there is a big acceptance, especially also from uh, citizens, to live in such a future-oriented city structure. And this gives us uh, the power to decide that we have to implement such a structure more and more, not just in model cities like Heidelberg, also on a national level. So just this example shows 12 years ago, we decided and implemented this strategy. These cities are built in Heidelberg, and maybe in 12 years, this will be a national standard. So we have a gap of nearly 20 years of an implementation of a good uh, available technology, a little plus of uh, two to 3% higher investment costs, that's everything. So uh, uh, I'm really believing that this is a great opportunity and we're doing this also in many other sectors. The whole downtown area is served by long distance heating, no uh, 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 separate chimneys anymore in the downtown area. 
50% is already green long distance heating and to 2030, uh, we expect it to be also climate neutral. We're buying 100% uh, green electricity uh, for the schools, the kindergartens, uh, for all the facilities. And also with our own energy utility, we are able to change the energy policy quite stronger because we are the owner of the energy utility. So my position as the mayor, I'm the head of the energy utility and we decide in the board, no, we just wanted to buy green. That's a very easy step, a political step, but it's done if you have the political power. Same in the traffic field. I'm the head of uh, the tram system, the bus system in the board, so I can decide we want to go green, so we are buying hydrogen buses, we're going electric, we implemented a huge expansion of the tram network. And till today, we reached that only 20% of our citizens are just using cars. The rest, 80%, are using bikes, going by a mass transport system or are pedestrians. So we reach a very high standard by implementing these strategies very consequent because we have the political power. And that's the reason why I come to the political message, which I wanted to give you. We need more local authorities are empowered. So if you have the responsibility for the energy sector, if you have the responsibility for the traffic sector, you can decide it on a political level with your citizens. This is very, uh, very fast implementation strategy and it's not based on a national strategy, which is mostly too weak and takes too long for the implementation phase. And by going this way, every second year uh, report to the city council how far we are away from the uh, so-called zero emission targets. We really can achieve those very high and ambition targets much easier, much faster, much earlier. And this is the message to the national and supranational leaders. Give us the power, give us also uh, the, access, the access to funding. This is also the role of the GCOM, which we have to uh, fight for. And uh, the Green Deal in Europe, in my opinion, is a very good deal because we made the deal. We are going with the national targets and much further, but we need then the direct link to the funding programs on the EU level, for example, in Europe. Uh, uh, and to other international funds on the international level. So wonderful to be with you. And if you want to get any information, please call me, go out to our website, and I'm very pleased uh, to uh, stay in contact with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Wurzner, for uh, the overview that you provided us around, of course, the political commitment and how you can really drive action through a variety of sectors, but also for reflecting on the responsibility, the mandates and the tough job that a mayor and a local government have to do to really uh, make sure that these transitions that we are all aiming to is implemented on the ground. And for finishing with this political message of encouragement and of the willingness to, to have more cities join our, our community. So now I would like to to travel a little bit virtually to another part of the world and we go to, to Australia where uh, Lord Mayor Anna Reynolds will share with us a little bit of the important work that local governments are doing in terms of facilitating and fostering really and driving a green recovery. So we look forward to hearing a little bit your perspective of course Mayor Reynolds and uh, the experience of Hobart. Thank you so much for having me tonight and uh, I'd like to say Hello to all of the mayors and city representatives that are joining us to, tonight. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the, the land on which the city of Hobart was built, the Muanina people, uh, and acknowledge uh, that uh, they survived invasion and dispossession and continue to maintain their identity, their culture and their rights. Uh, global GCOM mayors, um, we know that we need a zero carbon recovery, and I'm sure you've heard that many times at this COP. Uh, we are all um, focused on the pressing need to help our economies recover from COVID, but um, we're also, we can't lose sight of the urgent threat of climate change. Uh, and certainly in Oceania, uh, we are a long way from the COP but we are very much behind all of the um, 
all of the words and uh, agreements and uh, work that's happening there to try and uh, advance advance a global agreement. Uh, so because uh, cities are home to half of humanity, we can make a very significant difference. Uh, and we really are crucial partners in delivering the emission reductions needed to keep the global heating to as close as possible to 1.5 degrees. Uh, our cities and towns are seeing the damage right now. Our residents are needing the support to rebuild after damage uh, and to overcome the trauma of extreme weather. Uh, and certainly in Australia with the devastating bushfires that we've had in the last couple of years, the, the, the trauma uh, and the mental health impacts of uh, climate change are very apparent. Our organisations and our budgets are being thrown off course by the impacts that we are feeling today. Uh, and um, just as we are responsible for dealing with that, those impacts, we are also uh, crucial players in the making the necessary changes for the zero emissions future. So we uh, as city leaders uh, can go further and faster though when we have partners to work with. And we do need those partnerships and the support from national governments to de deliver the resilient urban infrastructure that the world urgently needs. In Australia, uh, local government is a bit different from Europe. Uh, we, we don't have that uh, regulatory power. I don't manage the public transport system. I don't own the energy company. I wish I did. Uh, but also local governments are really, we get approximately 3.7% of the taxation revenue raised in Australia. So it's not a significant. The vast majority goes to um, uh, national and state governments. So 3.7% of the taxation revenue but we're responsible for maintaining and managing 35% of the public infrastructure. And this is a huge financing gap that needs to be closed here in Australia, but I'm sure it's a very common experience in many parts of uh, Oceania, but other parts of the Asia Pacific and around the world. So with a much bigger investment in city level government, the world could deliver so much more in terms of both emissions action and adaptation. In June this year, a group of Australian mayors took a new GCOM Oceania research that we had undertaken, and we took that research to our capital of Canberra. The analysis showed that the emission reductions planned by just 60, 60 of the Australia's 527 local governments, the emission reductions planned by those 60 cities would achieve 96% of the current very unimpressive 2030 national target that our Prime Minister um, delivered at the COP recently. So this, these city governments are planning and implementing really significant emission reductions in their cities, uh, either directly or through influence. And our delegation of mayors explained to the national government officials that these planned emission reductions could be delivered so much faster if there was a national program to help us roll out projects. And with only six, with those significant reductions from just 60 uh, cities, imagine what would happen if you harness those 537 local governments in Australia. So in Australia, we are calling on the Prime Minister to work with us to design a national cities emission reduction program. And I'm actually calling on all national governments that want to go further and faster to please think about your local governments. Please partner with your cities and your local officials uh, and, um, and consider them uh, as really important organisations to empower with regulatory power and finance power. Uh, I am the Mayor of Hobart and that's the capital city of the island state of Tasmania in Australia. Uh, and as a mayor, I am, we are, our small city is sitting on the edge of the Southern Ocean. And, um, we're one of the global uh, gateway cities to Antarctica. And I know that global connections help us to make sense of the huge challenges that we have in tackling climate change. We have many polar scientists who call Hobart home. 
Uh, and every year they expedition off to collect million year old ice cores from Antarctica. And it's this global climate science that helps us understand how our small city will be impacted by climate change in the future. And so just like we're inspired uh, and informed by those global connections, many cities and towns in Oceania that are part of this network are inspired uh, by the connections we have to other cities. And it really does act as our compass and helps us stay on course about how we can take further action and how we can be inspired by the way that cities uh, are taking action around the world. We know that our individual city action won't save us from dangerous, cl dangerous climate change, but we do know that our local action uh, is important if, it's dem if we can see that we're part of that global movement. It does create hope. Uh, it's practical and it's real for people, but also our climate reforms and programs, even if they are small, uh, do create better places for people to live and they create more resilient communities and, and economies. So they are really uh, equitable places to invest climate finance rather than just investing in technology for big companies. Um, there's you. no doubt in my mind that um, we can, with the help of national and international actors, um, do more and uh, achieve more for the global climate. And I do encourage everyone to see cities as the really key partners for climate solutions. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Reynolds, for your introduction and also for your call for partnership to continue this journey together. As I mentioned at the beginning, with all hands on deck, really, but also for underlying the win-win that local uh, governments can bring to the table in making significant difference, the significant differences when it comes to implementing and tackling the climate crisis at the same time as fostering the green recovery. So thank you for 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 your uh, for your point, for your uh, insights, but also for your strong willingness to engage into this community of course and to try to foster this collaboration further and we will hear uh, a little bit more about how the global covenant of mayors will be supporting processes such as this one but also enabling more technical assistance um, to the cities that are part of our community later by our colleague Pier Roberto Remiti who will also be joining us from the GCOM uh, secretariat but now we, we I, I want to be true to my word and we mentioned the we will be uh, trying to be as interactive as possible with all of you. So I would like to, want to launch a small exercise uh, to do all together. Uh, you can, of course, access our slido.com via the QR code or via the web address. And I would like to, ans to ask you all to answer a question. I would like you to answer it in one word. What is the key, in your opinion, to further accelerate local climate action and the implementation of the NDCs and with that, meet the, the targets of the Paris Agreement. So one key ingredient, one key element that you think can enable more and more and empower more and more local action uh, to, to take place and to be impactful in our mission to, in, to improve our activities, but also to really in, implement the Paris Agreement. So that's launched. Take your time, think carefully about your contribution, and we will have a, the opportunity to discuss and reflect a little bit uh, about what are the key ingredients for impact. But now, talking about what are the key ingredients for impacts when it comes to local climate action, it's my pleasure to give the floor to Paula Kirk and to Andy Deacon to explore a little bit some of the key findings of our GCOM annual aggregation report looking into the impact that, and the change and the transformation that our community is making. So hello, nice seeing you both. Thank you for being connected with us and the floor is yours. Thank you uh, so much, Georgia, uh, and thank you to uh, Lord Mayor Reynolds and Mayor Wurtner uh, for those introductory remarks. Uh, and thank you, Georgia, for the introduction. So I'm Andy Deacon, uh, Acting Managing Director of the Global Covenant and Mayor Secretariat team. Um, and it's great to be able to speak about the role of the Global Covenant on Cities Day at COP. Um, and uh, we'll highlight in the next few minutes the key role of city leadership in tackling the climate crisis and supporting and driving multi-level action. And we very much hope uh, that that will be fully reflected in the formal outcomes and um, from the negotiating side of, of COP26 as well. And Paula, maybe you want to introduce yourself as well. Thanks very much, Andy, and thank you for having us here today. Um, I'm Paula Kirk. I'm our Director of Climate and Sustainability at Arab. Um, and we've had the, the privilege of working with, with GCOM for the last number of years to, 
to do some of the analysis of the city reporting data. So we're going to present some of those findings to everyone today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, and we've got a, a lot of information uh, to convey very quickly, um, but uh, great to see continued growth across the Global Covenant Network. Um, now more than 11,000 city and local government commitments representing over 1 billion people. So the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy is now the world's largest alliance for city climate leadership. Um, and uh, that growth is continuing. Since 2017, more than 1,700 new cities and local governments, encompassing more than 200 million people, have committed to the GCOM Alliance. And today, nearly one quarter of the Earth's entire urban population is represented by a local government that's committed to climate action under the Global Covenant. These cities and municipalities comprise a very diverse uh, socioeconomic fabric, from small and mid-sized towns to the largest metropolises, and they're delivering climate action that reflects uh, local needs, and that remains the common thread linking them all together. Next slide, please. So what you're seeing here is that four out of every five of the GCOM signatories, so that's almost nine and a half thousand cities and local governments, have set climate mitigation targets in line with the common reporting framework. And this scatter diagram really is the basis of the, the fact that cities are going further and faster. This shows that cities and local governments, they're not only matching their national governments, but more than three quarters of GCOM signatories are going further by setting more ambitious targets. And more than half of the cities and the local governments are acting faster by accelerating the rate at which they aim to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. We also noted that a further 244 GCOM signatories are leading the way with net zero targets. That's if you can see on the, the, the right hand side, the light blue. And we know that there are more than a thousand cities now also signed up to the race to zero. And if we move on to the next slide, um, this is showing, we looked at the city inventories, we wanted to understand what is the impact that these ambitions can deliver in terms of global, um, global reductions. So based on the current targets and the actions reported by the GCOM cities and local governments, we see that they could collectively reduce global emissions by 1.9 gigatons of CO2 equivalent annually in 2030 compared to a BAU trajectory. And if you push that out to 2050, this figure is estimated to be 3.8 gigatons of CO2 emissions. So these are significant contributions to the essential global emissions that we need. And the next slide is back to you, Andy. Thanks, Paula. Um, so GCOM cities and local governments uh, across our uh, regional and, and national covenants report that buildings and transport are their most carbon intensive sectors, accounting for 62% for buildings and 30% for transport of their total emissions respectively. Uh, however, if GCOM signatories were able to complete the 100,000 plus actions that are planned, they could reduce their collective emissions footprint by more than 20%, of which 15% would be in buildings and 6% in transport. In low and middle income countries across Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Latin America and Oceania, GCOM signatories are responding to rising emissions from waste also, with at least 20% of all reported actions focused on that one sector. Next slide, please. Um, and since 2008, GCOM signatories have completed more than 8,500 climate mitigation and adaptation actions. Another 27,000 discrete climate actions are currently underway, with 4,000 of those focused explicitly on building adaptive capacity. So 609 uh, cities and local governments reported more than 1,400 high-risk hazards. Um, and we heard about some of those from Lord Mayor Reynolds. This is over two and a half times the number that were reported in 2019, suggesting increased efforts to assess climate risk and vulnerability across all GCOM regions. 
Uh, flooding, extreme heat and extreme rainfall remain the largest identified risks among GCOM signatories. Collectively, these high risk hazards affect 315 million people an and an estimated 2,900 vulnerable population groups, including youth and elderly, indigenous people, low income households and women and girls are exposed to high risk climate hazards. The latest data show that they're also starting to implement climate adaptation plans with more than half of uh, reporting cities reporting at least one action that corresponds to a high risk hazard. The majority of those adaptation actions are focused on water at just over um, a quarter buildings around 25% and health at 20% with several actions addressing more than just one sector. The Global Covenant has also been supporting the city's race to resilience and indeed helped to launch the initiative earlier this year, as well as the race to zero. And in building resilience and in tackling climate hazards, I would just like to point out that the city's race to resilience is open for further cities to continue to commit to. Um, and there are other events during the course of today uh, covering both races, but specifically on, on race to resilience and would encourage cities to take a look. And if they haven't already, but feel able to, to commit and pledge um, to the races. Next slide, please. And back to you, Paula. Thank you, Andy. And this is really looking at the finance and the funding, which we know we've heard a lot about already and we'll hear a lot more about over the next couple of days. Um, how do we unlock the finance that may be available to deliver the climate action? We looked at the worldwide funding for COVID-19 recovery measures. Um, this now exceeds $3.4 trillion. Um, we've identified that $850 billion of that is being earmarked for clean recovery. We've seen that since 2020, an estimated 171 billion US dollars has been committed to climate finance across buildings and energy sectors alone. So this highlights both the capacity and the willingness to finance action at the national level. In 2021, the state of the city's climate finance report um, from the climate uh, Cities Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, this reported that only 7% of the total funding needed to realise the full pipeline of city climate was being delivered. And moreover, only 9% of all the tracked urban project level data, $7 million was set aside for adaptation and resilience measures. So this highlights the gap between the mitigation and the adaptation financing. Um, both the total flow and the distribution of the urban climate finance are far short of the transformative changes that are required to meet, um, to meet uh, obligations at the moment. However, it's noted that greater financing and support are needed if countries are to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. We heard earlier about the, the, the 100,000 plus climate actions already in the pipeline um, that are soon to be implemented across the buildings and energy sectors. And we know that GCOM cities and local governments estimate a collective cost of 690 billion US dollars. So leveraging some of the insights from the, the, the recent coalition from urban transitions work, implementing these actions alone could deliver up to 11 million new green jobs and significantly enhance urban resilience, both of which can help safeguard national prosperity. Next slide, I think is back to you, Andy. Thanks, Paula. So with 759 million people lacking access to electricity worldwide, and another 2.6 billion relying on unsustainable cooking fuels or technologies and unequal energy supply across, re across regions, cities and local governments can play a pivotal role in helping facilitate equitable service provision and energy generation, as we heard from Mayor Wurzner earlier. In 2022, the Global Covenant of Mayors will launch the energy access and energy poverty pillar of the common reporting framework, which will allow cities and local governments to report against the related progress and milestones for the very first time. This helps facilitate signatory progress tracking, increased energy access and, and reduced energy poverty, and will build a community of experience, expertise and best practice 
among cities and local governments worldwide to take act action on this important issue. Next slide, please. Uh, so cities and local governments are demonstrating their sizable contributions to the climate fight in real time. Um, they're bolstering the volume of, of finance flows, um, and as, as we've heard uh, from our opening uh, board member speakers, also making more requests for more direct access to, to finance to support this activity. They're also um, ensuring equitable distribution um, to, to local, in, sorry, in uh, bolstering those finance flows and ensuring equitable distribution to local governments, low income countries can strengthen countries collective response to climate change and nations are leveraging and supporting the efforts uh, of their cities and and uh, as Lord Mayor Reynolds mentioned, um, those that are looking to work in partnership can go further and faster, but as the global covenant, we are looking to do this also together and um, Paula any final remarks from you. Sorry, I mean, just to add that um, the, the data this year, we've been looking at the analysis for the last number of years, um, and it's really striking this year to see the difference in terms of the evidence really showing how cities can engage um, to push this agenda further and faster. And just to echo the calls that were made earlier um, about national governments looking to the cities and governments as really where this work can, can happen. It can happen faster and it can be much more impactful. Thank you. So I'd encourage you all to take a look at the Global Covenant of Mayors.org uh, website to download a copy of the report. The QR code is on the screen there. Um, and just to um, see uh, how local government is taking um, bold, ambitious action in the face of the climate crisis. And um, just a few more slides. Uh, Georgia, next slide, please. Uh, then, in addition to uh, this week uh, announcing that uh, work to aggregate the activity from right across the Global Covenant Network, uh, then we've also launched some important work on multi-level climate action, the multi-level climate action playbook for local and regional governments. Next slide, please. Uh, so the playbook, it really is the uh, kind of new uh, all-in-one resource for local and regional governments um, with guidance uh, both uh, then to help link that local action to national governments and to try to uh, drive forward ambition. And it brings forward the idea of regional and local contributions um, and makes linkages between those um, and then uh, negotiating party policy developments as well. And we're very keen to facilitate credible climate commitments from the local level formally being recognized um, by parties um, in work that they're bringing forward then into the UNFCCC process. Next slide, please. Um, so again, um, uh, national governments can lead the way by integrating these regional and, and, and local uh, contributions into their national climate policy and NDC development processes and this playbook really is designed to show how to make those linkages and how to get us there and again there's a QR code that's now on the screen uh, but you can also go to globalcovenantofmares.org um, and download a copy of the playbook. Next slide please. Um, so some valuable new resources um, that really are trying to make these linkages between local and, and national level. We as the Global Covenant, as you've heard, are both um, continuing to draw results together to integrate new areas of work, whether that's um, improved risk and hazard reporting or now energy access and energy poverty, um, and look forward to um, continuing to um, draw a, right across this um, fabulous network of, of partners uh, on local governments that are willing to take bold ambitious action and to move us forward um, further and faster together. Thank you so much, um, Paula, to you and your team for the work to support that activity, to colleagues from the Global Covenant Secretariat, um, to our regional and national covenants and all of those in, engaged in the effort um, to get us here um, and to enable to bring these important contributions to COP. And back to you, Georgia. Thank you very much to both Andy and Paula for the overview provided. I think it's impressive to see how much 
impact local action can make really in an aggregated form. It's outstanding, really, this movement of going further and faster, how much this has been embedded into the, all the activities that uh, have been implemented by our local governments, part of our community. But also thank you for the reality check a little bit uh, to see what you were mentioning about only having 7% 7, 7 of the pipelines of our project covered by funding. I think it's, it's again showing that, yes, we are going further and faster, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, in, in really reaching our objectives. So thank you very much for, for your contribution. And I would like now to give the floor to, to Paolo Bertoldi um, to tell us a little bit more about what are the achieved results in particular in uh, Europe, East and South, of, also considering the Mediterranean area, and also to share an outlook to 2030. So Paolo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Georgia. Um, good morning or good evening. Um, I'm Paolo Bertoldi. I work for the European Commission Joint Research Center. Can you please move to the next slide? And I'm going to present you an assessment of the covenant of mayor in Europe and neighboring countries. Uh, we are a scientific uh, part of the European Commission, so you, we provide science for policy. Next slide. And we have been involved with the covenant since this, it starts in Europe in 2008. And now, we, of course, we're supporting the GCOM, uh, working closely with Andy and his team in Brussels and the old regional secretariat. And we do uh, different uh, um, activities, including the analysis of the, uh, uh, the result achieved by the participating cities in a parallel manner to the aggregation report uh, that Andy and Paula presented to you, mainly focusing on the, as I said, in Europe and neighboring countries. And we produce a number of reports and tools for cities. Next slide, please. Uh, just the history of the covenant from its start in 2008. I, I had the privilege to be there at the time. And uh, I would like to highlight that the GCOM uh, provide not only guidance and political leadership, uh, to uh, city all around the globe, but also tools and uh, uh, methodologies. And one that we'd like to mention is the Common Reporting Framework, which has been developed by the GCOM Technical Working Group on Data, which allows all the cities uh, around the globe to report their data in a uniform manner that allows the aggregation that uh, uh, Andy and Paula presented to you, and also help city to formulate a very um, important uh, plans, uh, targets, and actions in the most important sector, both for mitigation, adaptation, and very soon also for access to energy and energy poverty. Next slide. So now I'm focusing on the region, uh, uh, which is, as I say, is Europe and around. And mainly uh, in this area, uh, City report to the My Covenant reporting platform, one of the two, uh, which is also complemented by the uh, unified reporting platform by CDP and ICLE. In fact, we have also some uh, cities in this in this region as well in the world using the CDP and ICLE reporting form. But I just uh, would like today to focus on the data we collected from my covenant, which is an impressive number of cities is over 10,000, 10,629. And you can see also the split by uh, regions and the largest part, of course, in the European Union, over 9,800 but also in Eastern partnership. So uh, from Ukraine to the Caucasian countries, the North African shore of the Mediterranean from Morocco to Lebanon, and uh, also non-EU um, European countries, which now include also our colleagues from the UK, uh, Switzerland, Norway, and the West Balkans. Um, of course, uh, the number of cities is impressive. In terms of population, uh, we, in Europe, there is a large predominance by smaller and medium-sized cities. So uh, we only cover about 320 million. So, so one third of the total uh, GCOM population coverage, which just reached 1 billion and the same. Next slide, please. And this is an area and, and also density uh, program, which has been uh, for historical reason, very popular in Italy, Spain, Belgium, but is spreading across uh, as I said, also to uh, other geographical areas. You can see, you can see, for example, Lebanon, uh, Morocco, uh, Ukraine, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, out of these ten thousand cities, 
uh, uh, and plus about 6,800 6, uh, submitted an action plan during their journeys to the uh, GCOM participation. The majority is still uh, uh, focusing on mitigation. So seven, 5,700 plus plans, only 900 uh, covering uh, both mitigation adaptation and very few only adaptation. So, uh, but this share of uh, covering the mitigation adaptation is now increasing and is what we want to see because in, in, in most of the uh, our cities in the GCOM, uh, the adaptation is, is becoming the key issue due to the uh, fast changing uh, climate, the raise, uh, the raising temperature and the different risks that uh, affect our cities and bring damages. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the action plan, again, the majority of these action plan are from European cities, but we are also pleased to see many coming from uh, Com East, so the east part uh, of neighboring country to the, to the European Union, uh, and also an increasing number in, in, in uh, Com South. And we know that uh, about 120 are on the verge of being submitted to the GCOM4. Uh, so great uh, activity in this region as well. Next slide, please. Uh, city uh, have to, uh, to collect data, identify the sector with, where they can mitigate and uh, or adapt to climate change and, and formulate a plan and then it's very important that they monitor their progress. Uh, we know that collecting data is sometimes a painful, expensive exercise. So we try to minimize as much as possible this burden for cities, but still allows them to see if they're on track, to see and check their track to reach their target, eventually add additional policies or revise the policy and measures if they're not effective. And in terms of, of monitoring report uh, over the period from 2008 to 2020, uh, uh, of these uh, 6,000 organizations submitted a plan, we have received uh, 2,600 monitoring reports, mainly focusing on uh, mitigation. And again, the large majority from uh, the European Union, but also other regions, we see cities uh, valuing the, 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 uh, the importance of monitoring not just an obligation, but a tools helping them to uh, navigate and, and, and reach their target uh, as an important tools. Next slide, please. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, focus at the uh, commitment in the plan, we can only confirm what Andy and Paula said, that the city uh, has take on board a larger uh, or bigger uh, jurisdiction. So uh, by 2020, Europe had only a 20% reduction target and city were already signed up on average by 26. For the 2030 in the, in the region, uh, the European Union had a minus 40% until recently now has been raised to minus 55 and city were committing to minus 44 uh, collectively in the European Union, minus 47, of course, is important also to highlight that outside the EU, in particular in the Mediterranean area, uh, country have less ambitious uh, NDCs. So uh, they, uh, some of them are still committed to the same level as the EU, which show again, a much more ambitious uh, ambition level than uh, the national governments. Next slide. Uh, in my comment, we collected an impressive number of policy measures, uh, policy measures in the mitigation sectors with different instruments in the different sectors from buildings to transportation to industry to waste. Uh, and as I said, different instruments from information to financing to regulation uh, to PPPs. So uh, a, a, a very rich database uh, that uh, can be interested to uh, serve as example for other cities, see what the city has have done or implemented in order to uh, achieve their target. Next slide, please. In terms of emission reduction, we can now confirm that by 2020, our estimated with a very sophisticated model we're going to present to you, uh, a city in EU reached 23 uh, almost 24% uh, emission reduction against the initial target of 20%. So 
much better than than uh, national emission reduction. Next slide, please. And uh, basically, uh, we uh, uh, we also extended our model to uh, 2030. And here we see um, uh, that uh, city are at the moment target uh, uh, online to reach uh, a smaller uh, emission reduction than what they committed. So there is a gap. And this means that cities are doing well, but must, most they need to reinforce their action, uh, be again more determined to implement them, to bring new action online, such a way that, that they can uh, again go back to the original track uh, uh, sl uh, slope and and uh, reach the minus forty seven uh, target. There, are, of course, uh, a, a different. Uh, um, variety of cities, some uh, already with climate uh, cl uh, climate neutral target at 2040 and very close to climate neutral 2030, which are going much faster, some a bit uh, uh, slower, but uh, collectively we can say that the indication are good, but it's still a, a warning that they have to continue working hard uh, to reach this uh, 2030 target. Next slide, please. Uh, on adaptation, uh, we have uh, almost 4,000 cities uh, committed to uh, adaptation, so about 40% of the total uh, sample of cities we have analyzed. Um, and uh, the uh, out of these 4,000, uh, only about 1,000 have submitted a plan. Uh, the adaptation pillar is much more complex. Uh, has been introduced later on in, in the journey towards the GCOM. And, 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 and we see the share increase, but still is, is low compared to mitigation. So uh, it's in particular a message to, to city, please uh, adopt your mitigation plan, do the, your risk of limit assessment and, and uh, take actions. So we, uh, we can see that the, out of these almost 1,000, uh, 800 plus have uh, uh, completed the risk evaluation assessment. Very important to know what are the risks, uh, which are the vulnerable sectors in the cities. Uh, uh, some uh, about 500, 400 cities have an adaptation goal, so what they want to achieve in terms of adaptation, and uh, uh, about the same number also uh, as adaptation uh, actions in, in their plan. Next slide, please. Here, uh, we can confirm the finding of the global report, highlighting that flood and sea level rise is the highest or the major hazard in the region, followed by heavy precipitation and wildfires, extreme heat and droughts and water scarcity. Next slide, please. Uh, we also see that all uh, cities have declared that uh, the impact of the climate hazard is medium to high and that they will expect all of them an increase in intensity ap apart from the other extreme cold which most probably will uh, be declining due to the increased uh, uh, average temperature of the globe but let's say all the other from uh, flooding to wildfires to heat wave will increase in intensity and frequency so a very worrying uh, situation uh, that city will face. And while we wait uh, for the high level policy and the contribution of all the humanity to uh, um, decline in emission, uh, it is expected that in the coming decade, uh, this hazard will become, as I say, more frequent and more intense. So city do not have, have to wait, but they shall take action as soon as possible. Sorry, Paolo, to interrupt yes. you. Apologies, just wanted to flag that it's now 10.59 here, so very shortly there will be the two minutes of silence that we are observing for Amnesty's Day. Okay, uh, um, just warn me at least 30 seconds before and I stop, of course, but I'm closing to finish my presentation. Thank you again, Georgia. So can we go to the next slide? Um, then we analyzed the, who are the, which one are the most vulnerable sectors as reported by cities and they report agriculture and forestry was subject to flooding, to drought, uh, the civil protection and the environment and biodiversity, again, uh, very much impacted by flooding and by uh, wildfires. Next slide. And uh, of course, then uh, there is also 
um, the different sectors are uh, of the um, the society are again um, uh, each sector is compared to the different hazards that impacting uh, confirming again in particular for agriculture the the water scarcity is also very important uh, and for uh, the diversity uh, biodiversity again uh, drought and water scarcity so uh, putting in peril the uh, the wild uh, nature uh, and the biodiversity uh, around cities and in cities. Next slide, please. Uh, the population group that is affected by uh, the uh, climate risk, uh, and there is a predominance of the elderly population in cities, low-income household, and person living in substandard housing. Uh, and so the vulnerable, uh, the poorest, uh, maybe uh, part of our population, are the most affected. And so we, there is a, an ethical and social justice uh, imperative. Uh, Thank you, for Paolo. Apologies again. So it's 11 now, and I will ask everyone to stand, please, and to observe these two minutes of silence. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. So we can now restart your, your, your session. Paolo, maybe you would like to conclude briefly? Yes, uh, correct. If you can move to the next slide. Uh, so again, uh, the risk is then um, assigned to the different population. And uh, it's very important to highlight how the elderly people are most vulnerable to extreme heat, of course, um, low income to extreme heat and extreme cold. And finally, pe uh, persons living in substandard housing are very uh, um, affected by heavy precipitation. Next slide. I think this was um, uh, just the last slide. So uh, in, in comparison to mitigation, in adaptation, we have only 10,000 uh, action reported, uh, it, with 16% uh, uh, covering both mitigation adaptation. So getting you know the both benefit on mitigation adaptation with, with some actions. Um, and the uh, most of the action cover extreme heat, uh, drought, uh, and, and water scarcity in every precipitation. So we see that city use the risk of assessment to plan the policy and the measures really and the action to reduce the most important risk and protect the most vulnerable uh, part of their population. So they're really showing how it's important to have a good risk vulnerability assessment. Um, next slide. Uh, and uh, again, uh, this is how the um, adaptation action are uh, divided among the risk, and you can see extreme heat is the predominant fall again by every precipitation and drought and water scarcity. 
a next slide. I, I think need to I'm, ask you I to think I think Laura. we can jump to the next slide and thank you. Uh, the so um, go one more slide, please. Okay, so I conclude my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. All these will be uh, reported in a soon to be published report by the GLC, uh, giving even further information, more detailed information. And I hope the key message that I tried to convey to you on the importance of reporting data and monitoring your track, uh, if you're on track to reach your target and to uh, increase the effort of adaptation have uh, been well received. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo, and sorry for rushing you through the last slides. As you can see, this report is very dense and it will make a very good homework for all of us, of course, to explore. I also want to thank everyone for your cooperation once again in our uh, two minutes of remembrance. So thank you very much for that as well. But now we have heard a lot about uh, how cities are impacting with their action, uh, the, the, the tackling of climate change. And we have heard about this collective stock taking of our community and how through this reporting that is being enabled via of our, via the GCOM and collected within our report, we can also monitor how science-based evidence is leading and supporting policy making and implementation. So it's now time to hear a little bit from the experience of the cities directly, how they are participating into the GCOM, of course, but most of all, how are they implementing their action? How are they monitoring what they are doing? And how are they accelerating their plans to achieve uh, our collective objectives of the Paris Agreement? So it's my great pleasure now to invite here on the stage with us, uh, Alejandra, uh, Boyo. And uh, as I mentioned before, Alejandra is from the city of Merida, and we look forward to hear a little bit more about how Merida is facing all these challenges and successfully also implementing its solutions. Is it yes, working? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting Merida and me to share this space. Thanks to the people present being here and to the ones joining us from the virtual session. Uh, to give you a general idea, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of Merida. This is a city located in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It is the capital and concentrates half the population of Yucatan. We have reached 1 million inhabitants. The municipality of Merida has gradually, as you can see, materialized and matured its role in climate action, starting by identifying and comprehend our climate issues, such as the urban expansion, resulting on deforestation and loss of green areas and soil, uh, increase in solid waste generation and also raise in temperatures and the presence of extreme hydrometeorological events like floods, drugs, forest fires, and hurricanes. For those reasons, uh, in 2015, the Sustainable Development Unit was created, as, as you can see in the slide, and as, it, as a city hall office began to provoke that more transversal efforts happened. Uh, for the third time, we have aligned our municipal development plan to the 2030 agenda and uh, voluntarily reporting our performance on this. Also, uh, Merida has generated its regulation for the protection of urban trees, built in conjunction with the state government, more than 70 kilometers of bicycle lanes, uh, most, much, uh, most of all with recycled materials, and uh, we have installed solar panels on 99 of our public buildings and create tax reductions uh, for those citizens that use uh, solar panels or green roofs, uh, not only on their homes, but maybe on their commerces and retail. And uh, even uh, supplying public lighting on uh, with more than 50% with geothermal uh, energy. In the past three years, the municipality allocated more than 10 million US dollars on this kind of actions. Uh, we also improved our regulation. Uh, we made our municipal uh, climate action plan 
and uh, an integral urban mobility plan with also our GHG emissions uh, diagnosis, uh, will, which will be uh, soon to be uh, actualized. But as you can see here, we try to build our public policies uh, and projects with an active citizen participation. For example, with the use of platforms uh, that help us reach this main objective, even uh, on a pandemic scenario. Uh, governance is also a key to be able to execute projects with synergistic results. All these efforts also respond to the commitments we have made such as the call to action for protecting our urban forests. Recently, we added to the efforts of cities race to zero by 2050. And we are clear that we need strategic alliances um, with the key partners that can help us and join us with their experience working worldwide. And uh, of course, uh, making of the international funding a reality. Uh, and helping us reach our goals on an efficient in a productive way to face our need on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Uh, next slide. I want uh, to thank you in the name of our mayor, uh, Renan Barrera, for the opportunity to share our vision, uh, our role here, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alejandra, for your presentation and for sharing the great activities and actions that Merida is implementing on the ground and also for talking about, again, the importance of partnership in these races that we are running together to really meet the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the importance of governance and cooperation across level and across sectors to really make this happen together with our communities, of course. Can I invite you to stay on stage with us? And I would like now to give the floor to a second speaker, a second local leader that will be sharing with us uh, a little bit how the city of uh, Baguio in the Philippines has been moving from planning to action and adapting to climate change and building resilience on the ground. So, Antoinette Anaban, the floor is yours. Good morning and good evening from the city of Baguio, Philippines. Thank you for inviting the city of Baguio to participate in this uh, very important event. On behalf of Mayor Benjamin Magalo, who is currently attending an equally important event, may I deliver his presentation titled Planning to Action, Adapting to Climate Change and Building Resilience. Next, please. I want to start my presentation with a short profile of our city. Baguio City is a small city with a land area of 57.5 square kilometers. It is popularly known as the summer capital of the Philippines due to its cold climate. It is originally designed for 25,000 to 30,000 people. However, with rapid urbanization, our population has already reached 366,000 in 2020 with an annual population growth rate of 1.54. Next, please. Baguio City is faced with some challenges relative to climate change. First is the high amount of rainfall, which causes flooding and frequent rain-induced landslides, which are secondary to heavy rainfall. You should understand that Baguio is one of the cities in the entire Philippines with the highest amount of rainfall. The latest strong tropical cyclone that hardly hit the city last month has recorded amount of rainfall of 625.3 millimeter in 24 hours. This surpasses the amount of rainfall that were recorded during the past strong typhoons. Water scarcity, on the other hand, is caused by rapid urbanization and declining green covers due to encroachment of settlements in watershed areas where we source our water. Next, please. The following are the major current initiatives of the city to adapt to climate change or mitigate the effects of climate change to the city. These initiatives include flood mitigation and control, environmental rejuvenation, public utility vehicle modernization, and the establishment of a platform for climate resilient and low carbon development. Next, please. Aligned to the de development direction of the city, the Asian Development Bank is supporting Baguio City in implementing the Smart Flood Early Warning Information and Mitigation System project. The project is assisting the city with both the planning for flood mitigation and the delivery of the services of flood early warning and responses using smart technologies. 
Next, please. Another new project which just started uh, last month is a knowledge and support technical assistance for the establishment of the platform for climate resilient and low carbon urban development. This te technical assistance is aligned with the reduction of the city's vulnerability to catastrophic climate events and reduction of city's carbon emissions and air pollution levels. Next, please. In Baguio, transportation is the major source of carbon emissions and of pollution in the city. Last year, Baguio City was the first to express interest to participate in the United Nations Development Program and the Department of Transportation Project on Low Carbon Urban Transport Systems in the Philippines. As a result, the city is now transitioning from the current vehicles to high quality public transit requisites such as vehicles with higher capacity and no emission. Next, please. The Next, please. The recent dump site has been producing methane gas, contributing to greenhouse gases and an unbearable foul odor, creating an unhealthy environment for the communities living nearby. Today, this was converted into an ecological park, as you can see in the slide, and is continuously being improved. Next, please. The city has crafted its urban forest uh, master plan to rehabilitate and improve not only our forests, but also our green spaces. Tree planting has always been a practice by various organizations in the city. However, the survival rates of these trees planted is very low. Hence, the city established nurseries to grow trees until they are ready to be planted for higher survival rate. Next, please. Water scarcity is also being experienced in the city, especially during summertime. That's around uh, between March to May. On the local government side, we established a strong collaboration with our local water provider regarding the establishment of additional rainwater harvesting facilities in at least uh, three watershed areas. The local government also is doing its part to safeguard and conserve our watershed being the source of our water supply. Next, please. Those I have mentioned are just among the many initiatives of the city to adapt to climate change and build the resilience of our local communities during this current administration. And these were, can you please click? And these were made possible through the demonstrated, demonstrated good governance, political will, and commitment to improve the quality of life of the people of Baguio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Antoinette Anabam, for for your presentation and for sharing with us the experience of the city of Baguio. Um, I think it's very interesting to see how some of the, of the different measures that you have mentioned, including you know, the impact that transport sector and even the waste sector has, uh, but also how the rainfall measures and the water scarcity it, are, are, are key issues in your cities. It's a little bit of the trends that we were seeing in the aggregation report a few minutes ago, looking into how increasing measure on adaptation are being undertaken, but also how some of these sectors still need to be tackled. So speaking about uh, this measure, these ingredients, this, this, this type of uh, activities and solutions that still need to be provided in order to implement the local action that we need on the ground, I would like to go quickly back to the results of our work cloud and to have a peek through what our audience is thinking around what are the key ingredients to further accelerate local climate action and implementation of the NDCs. So, oh, I think it's very, very interesting to see the collaborations comes up right at the middle. This was definitely the core of most of our introduction to Mayor Hobart, but of course also the city of Merida. We're mentioning our partnership are definitely a key to, to that point, but also finance pops up here and there together with leadership. And I think all the cities that we had the pleasure to have here today, of course, have shown how leadership is an essential element when it comes to implement climate action. So I think also looking into different types of different uh, items, such as the focus on resilience, but also um, youth and the importance of really bringing the community together and to implement and to drive this transformation together, it's still an essential element. So thank you for, uh, to everyone for your thoughts around the key ingredients. And I would like now to give the floor to Piero, Pier Roberto Remiti, uh, who will tell us a little bit how are we going to try to use this idea around key ingredients and how do they fit into the plan of support that the Global Covenant of Mayor Secretariat wants to roll out in the future. So Piero, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Georgia, and 
Thank you. Of course, all the speakers for the very inspiring discussion. We have been listening uh, uh, about a lot of uh, actions uh, already implemented and others under implementation. And of course, uh, uh, a lot of uh, action and, and uh, resources that should be mobilized soon for next implementation and uh, reaching the ambitious target our cities have been uh, fixing in, the, in their own climate action plan and strategies. Uh, let me give you a very short limiting uh, a few minutes uh, overview about uh, how the GCOM, the Global Covenant of Mayors, uh, would be able to help and support this process for next intensive action, uh, action implementation process. Um, the, the next slide, please, uh, return to this, yes. Thank you very much. Exactly. Uh, um, a very short premise is, 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 is um, needed to this respect. Uh, as you probably might know, most of the audience should already know, but again, to be reminded that the European Commission started since one year, October 2020, exactly to uh, concretely and uh, intensively support also the action of the Global Covenant of Mayor Secretariat complementing in this way the support that was already provided in the previous year to many, most of the regional covenants. And exactly within this framework, uh, the global covenant of mayors will start, will be starting soon uh, in the very first uh, early months of the 2022 next year to provide either technical support and technical assistance directly to uh, cities, countries, and uh, regional covenants that are part uh, of the alliance and organization. I am using this slide just for uh, sakes of clarity, uh, where all the three different types of support we are going to provide uh, are uh, previously uh, very, very briefly explained. Uh, we'll be providing support for development of 50 climate action plans. Uh, and this will be targeted to countries and uh, cities and region and, and, and uh, related uh, partners organization uh, that are not yet uh, services by the Global Covenant of Mayors uh, um, supports. So meaning that uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors is, uh, presence is very limited or totally absent in the counties and in the region. So this is of course, in order to fill the I have to say still very few gaps in the geographical distribution of the uh, Global Covenant Alliance uh, worldwide. Uh, mainly those regions should be the regions and counties in the Central Asia, in the Middle East part, uh, some few counties in Africa where the GCOM assistance so far has been limited, and also Pacific Islands, I'm looking for the Mayor uh, uh, Reynolds here. Um, so in those countries, our uh, technical team will support for development of the action plan. A second type of support will be provided as well on, uh, uh, let's say on the track, uh, on the pathway that has been already tracked by the GAP found. Uh, probably you are, most of you are already very much informed on this. So trying to fill the gaps of technical capacity for, let's say the, the, the last mile round, once the projects are identified in the climate action plan, then to provide support to cities that are not really capable, that are not available resources in order to implement the more uh, related stages and steps for project realization, pre-feasibility, feasibility, and structure on the project. So our team will provide this kind of support. Roughly, we count on uh, support provided to around 20 projects again, following up the pathway already tracked and started by the GAP found. And there should happen at least, let's say, in a, in a very average way uh, to one region's, uh, one project for one region, so this would be, again, um, trying to target, uh, first of all, and most of all, the medium and low uh, income counties, the developing counties, and then small and intermediary cities that are the most in the need of this kind of support. 
As a third kind of support, last but not least in this uh, summary, in the, this very short and brief summary, we are providing support for multi-level implementation of climate and action plans and integrating within the NDC national cycle and investment, uh, uh, and investment process. Um, we are doing this next right place in this case. We are doing this during, through setup uh, of uh, uh, multi-level platform for uh, exchange and coordination where all the different key stakeholders will participate. Uh, and this will be supported through uh, organization of matchmaking events uh, in each own countries, uh, where all the stakeholders will have starting the starting opportunity to start exchange on how to uh, define, set up, implement uh, uh, a multi-level action, a multi-level process for full integration of the uh, of their own climate action plan within the NDC. This is a subject very much related to uh, this particular uh, session and activity of the LGMA. Um, so Thank those you. are the three kinds uh, of, uh, of activities we are going to provide in the next uh, very few months, uh, starting and running until the end of our support, the European support until end of 2024. Please, for further detail that I could provide technical details now, but of course, I don't want to, to take more time. So please feel free to contact me or any other from the uh, Global Secretariat through our communication, usually communication channels, website and social media. We'll be happy to provide that. In any case, those details will be published soon. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you, much, Georgia. Piero. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you very much for your sharing all of these different great uh, new initiatives and proposals uh, that we have uh, in the pipeline to support our GCOM cities. So we are almost at the end of our session here. And uh, very soon I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Gregor Robertson, our GCOM Global Ambassador. But before I do that, I wanted to see if the our two board uh, members are still on the line with us. Uh, Mayor Wurzner, I don't know if you're still with us. Maybe not at the moment. I just wanted to maybe have an opportunity to hear one final message on, on, behalf, of, on behalf, of course, of um, of our policy board member to see if there was anything that they wanted to share with our community and uh, maybe Andy then uh, since Mayor Wurzner and Mayor Reynolds seem to be not connected at the moment with us perhaps you want to share a quick message of encouragement to the communities that are connected with us today and thinking still thinking about joining the GCOM Alliance. Thanks so much Georgia and Mayor Reynolds is with us so I'll hand to her very quickly in a second. Um, but just to say that we talked about um, identifying the work that cities are doing to go further faster. Um, but my key message would be to not miss the together part of the equation um, and to just echo that call for multi-level uh, action that we really hope is reflected in the formal outcomes from COP as it is in the Paris Agreement um, to recognize the important role that um, local government at all levels is playing uh, to deliver on global climate action. Um, maybe to you, Mayor Reynolds. Thank you. And thanks everyone for attending. Thanks again for involving uh, me. And uh, thank you particularly to all of the, uh, the folks that provided uh, some um, insights into their cities and the great work that's happening. I think the work that is happening all around the world is so inspiring. It's inspiring to, each, to, to all of us, to each other as other uh, fellow mayors. But it is also inspiring for our city, for our for our residents and our businesses, because they can um, really feel connected to this very significant global challenge. Um, it is important to realise that we are really racing against time, and so I guess we've just all got to make sure that our work is accessible, that we are very strong in our messaging as leaders about the need to move fast, uh, and that we push as hard as we can. Uh, also as leaders to ensure that not only is the action happening in our cities, but is happening um, at the state, national and international level as well. And our voices together are very powerful and we need to 
work together to, to really ensure that those voices are clear and our message is clear and our message is strong together. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Reynolds, also for this encouraging message of, of partnership and continuation of work together. And now the very difficult job of giving our final and closing remarks to Mr. Robertson. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, I'm Gregor Robertson, the Global Ambassador for GCOM and uh, former Mayor of Vancouver, Canada, and honored to be here in uh, Scotland for the COP and, and want to thank everyone who's spoken and presented the case for cities, uh, which is so critical to our success in tackling the climate emergency. Today is Cities Day here at COP26, and this is incredibly important because cities collectively represent a massive opportunity to take climate action and to reduce our impacts in the years to come. We have been uh, generously supported by the European Commission, by the Bloomberg uh, Philanthropies, uh, and the Global Covenant stands ready to continue to scale up our efforts further and faster, supporting cities and communities around the world to take climate action. We heard from uh, Merida uh, to, um, to Bagui in the Philippines, uh, from my city in Vancouver to Cape Town. We've had incredible leadership from mayors and their teams, all of the councils and staff that work at cities in delivering climate action. And that's out of necessity. Our cities are feeling devastating impacts. We've heard some of this uh, from our mayors. Uh, we've seen uh, communities wiped out by fires and droughts. Uh, so climate action is absolutely critical. The challenge we face, and, and we see it on our word cloud from, from what everyone listening and tuned in has, has said, collaboration and finance. And finance and funding are all over that world cl word cloud as uh, hand in hand with that collaboration with levels of government. Our message today is a very simple and clear message. We need, as cities around the world, more support, more investment from national governments to take action on climate. That is what we need. That partnership is fundamental to our success. As, uh, as our mayor in Hobart and board member said, uh, the cities don't have enough capital to take action. We are responsible for infrastructure. We cannot repair and rebuild and restore infrastructure and adapt to climate without more resources from our national governments. The funding must flow urgently to cities and cities are ready to roll that out. Over 80% of our 11,700 cities around the world have climate action plans and have results on the ground, working with community, working in partnership with local businesses and entrepreneurs, working with labor unions. Partnership is what we do. We need a stronger partnership from our national governments. We need funding to get the work done on the ground to deliver the infrastructure and the, and the, the protection we need for our people. So that's the basic message here today. A billion inhabitants of our planet in cities are committed to this through our 11,700 mayors. We know that that's what it's going to take to solve this climate crisis. It can't be any more urgent than it is today. And, and uh, so as, as a unified voice um, from our 1 billion inhabitants and all of our mayors uh, to our national governments wrapping up here in Glasgow, please take action and support our cities with more investment so that we can increase, go further and faster on our climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this very encouraging and strong word, we finish our session of today. I want to thank very much all of the speakers and the panelists, both here and remotely. And we look forward to continuing this, the, the discussion with you. And of course, to share with you more of the success of our GCOM community. So thank you very much once again, and hopefully we'll speak each other very soon.